Hello, I am Christian Malaga and this video will introduce a few foundational concepts in structural dynamics. Structural dynamics is unavoidably one of the more mathematically demanding branches of structural engineering. However, I will try to keep the math as simple as possible and focus on the underlying principles. This series of on-demand short videos will introduce some key concepts that you need to know before the lectures. This video, in particular, will cover two concepts that will underpin our work in structural dynamics. These concepts include the concept of degree of freedom and the definition of the equation of motion. In addition, we will learn to formulate the equation of motion using Newton's second law of motion and D'Alembert's principle. Let's start by realizing that the aim of engineering is to provide fitting and timely solutions to some of the most pressing human needs, balancing economy and safety. To this end, we engineers build structures, systems and devices which need to withstand not only static loads, but also dynamic loads, some of which can be extreme, such as earthquakes. In order to understand why some structures fail and to be able to design them safely, we engineers build models. These models which can be experimental or numerical, allow us to gain insight into the response of structures and their diverse loading scenarios. In order to arrive to an efficient and effective model, we, engineers, introduce a number of assumptions and idealizations aimed at making the problem mathematically manageable. These mathematical models provide the link between the real world and the mathematically feasible expressions we conceive as analogies of that real world. In this part of the course, we will deal only with single degree of freedom systems, such as the one presented in this figure. A single degree of freedom system is one whose deformation can be completely defined by a single displacement. More generally, for the purpose of this module, we will define the number of degrees of freedom of a system as the number of independent parameters necessary to specify its configuration at any given time. We are used in structural engineering to use coordinates as degrees of freedom. One question we are usually confronted with is the question of the minimum number of degrees of freedom necessary to have a sufficiently accurate picture of the response of a structural system. Take a look at this video. This is a one-third scale experimental model of an 18-story steel building tested in the largest shaking table in the world, located in Hyogo, Japan. Can you answer the question of what will be the minimum number of degrees of freedom that you will use to model this building? You can pause and repeat the video if you need. Now, take a look at this other model of a section of a reinforced concrete walled building tested in the outdoor shaking table at the University of California at San Diego. What will be the minimum number of degrees of freedom that you will use to model this building? Obviously, most real structures will have many, even an infinite number of degrees of freedom, but a surprisingly large number of them can be modeled as a single degree of freedom system. In fact, single degree of freedom idealizations lay at the heart of most seismic design codes, such as Eurocode 8. More importantly, perhaps, we can introduce the most important concepts in structural dynamics with reference to single degree of freedom systems before moving on to more complex structures. This figure shows a single degree of freedom system comprising a mass m subjected to a time-varying external force f of t 
and attached to a spring of stiffness K and a viscous damper with a damping coefficient C. The external time varying force F of T causes a displacement that also changes in time that we are calling U of T. We can imaginarily cut through the damper and spring connectors and visualize the internal forces F sub K and F sub C, corresponding to the spring force and the damper force, respectively. The question is, what is the mathematical expression that describes the motion of this system? In other words, we want to formulate the equation of motion. The equation of motion is that mathematical expression that defines the dynamic displacement of a structural system and whose solution will provide a complete description of its response in time. There are at least three ways in which that equation can be formulated for any given system. First, by means of Newton's second law of motion. Second, by establishing dynamic equilibrium through the principle of D'Alembert that is intimately related to the virtual work principles. And finally, by energetic principles leading to Lagrange's equation. In this video, we will only introduce the first two. Let's start with Newton's second law, which states that the net sum of the forces acting upon a body corresponds to the rate of change of momentum of that body. Expressing the rate of change of momentum by the differential of i over t and realizing that the momentum is mass times velocity and that for most civil engineering problems the mass of the system will remain constant, then the net sum of forces acting upon a body, which we call f, will be equal to mass times acceleration. We are using here the dot notation to represent differentiation with respect to time. If we go back to our representation of the single degree of freedom system, we can now evaluate F. As we said before, F is the net sum of forces acting upon the mass M. In this case, the sum of Fk, Fc and big F. And all that will be equal to the rate of change in momentum of that body or mass times acceleration. If we now look at each one of these terms in more detail, we can see that according to Hooke's law, the spring force F sub k will be equal to the spring elongation u, which varies in time, times the stiffness constant k. Likewise, the force in the viscous damper will be proportional to the velocity and that constant of proportionality will be the damping coefficient c. Therefore, introducing these terms into our previous equation and rearranging, we get to the final expression of our equation of motion. Mass times acceleration plus c times velocity plus k times displacement, equal to the external force F, which also changes in time t. The equation we have just derived is the equation of motion. The way we have derived this equation shows that the motion in the system is caused by the lack of equilibrium which results in an acceleration of the mass m. An alternative way to look at the system, and one that is probably more appealing to most of you after your years of training in statics, is through D'Alembert's principle. D'Alembert's principle is based on the idea of a fictitious inertia force T that is equal to the product of the mass times its acceleration and acts in the opposite direction to the acceleration. The mass is at all times in equilibrium under the resultant force F and the inertia force T. In this approach, the mass is idealized as having a similar effect to that of the spring and damper, basically by producing a retarding force proportional to the motion. That means that now, we can rely on our well-developed sense of equilibrium and apply it to all internal forces. Hence, the stiffness force, the damping force, the external force and the fictitious inertia force are all in equilibrium and must then add up to zero. It is of course important to keep in mind that the inertial force applied in this way is fictitious and that the system is not really in equilibrium, otherwise there will be no motion. However, D'Alembert's principle of dynamic equilibrium is extremely useful and will allow you to use your background knowledge of statics to solve dynamic problems.
in the form presented here, the equation of motion describes how the lateral motion, u of t, of the mass m and its derivatives are related to the externally applied load, f of t. If the coefficients m, c and k are constant, then we are in front of a linear second-order differential equation. We will spend most of our time in this module solving this equation.